So in the Merlab, Lab, we've had a really long standing interest in uh, chromosin organization, specifically the dynamics of chromosin organization during hematopoiesis, uh, blood cell generation. Uh, we've done a substantial amount of work looking at the role of sequestration of lineage determining genes, specifically transcription factors, and their se sequestration to the nuclear envelope, the, the B compartment um, as defined by IC, um, and then their timed release during development into the A compartment. Um, and we've put out a, a good amount of work on B lymphocytes, looking at this phenomenon, uh, we recently posted a new manuscript to bioarchive. People are interested looking at this phenomenon in plasma cells. Um, and then we've also done some work in T lymphocytes. Uh, so when I joined the lab, I became very interested in the innate immune system, the myeloid lineage, um, specifically looking at the differentiation of granulocyte monocyte progenitors into uh, the monocyte and granulocyte lineage, uh, specifically from the chromatin organization standpoint, um, as these cells, uh, the nuclei take on these really distinct uh, shapes, these distinct morphologies in the mature cells. Uh, for instance, get my pointer here. Um, monocyte nuclei look like little kidney beans. Uh, eosinophils and basophils take on, and the nucleus takes on a bilobe structure. Um, and the cell I'm going to talk about today, the neutrophil, actually takes on a structure wherein the genome is spread across uh, three to five distinct lobes in the mature neutrophil in human. Um, and this work has been an expansion of uh, work done previously at our lab by Yina Zhu that was published on uh, genes development last year, um, and she's been a very important collaborator. I'm not going to talk about that work, but uh, you can check out that. And I was looking at uh, the, the effects on chromatin organization on the acquisition of this polymorphic nuclear shape, as it's called, uh, in mouse neutrophil development. Um, so the mechanism of this development is somewhat known. Um, in your standard uh, cell, most, most cells in the body except granulocytes, um, the nuclear envelope uh, is, is quite rigid. Uh, it's due to high expression of nuclear lamin proteins, uh, particularly lamin A. Um, and then the nucleus is actually attached to the cytoskeleton of the cell via a complex called the link complex in my, my little MS paint drawing here. Um, and during neutrophil differentiation, what occurs is that the nuclear lamin proteins become uh, transcriptionally silenced. Uh, there's some amount of lamin B, but lamin A is completely downregulated. Um, and this allows the nucleus a uh, high amount of flexibility. And this is actually required uh, for neutrophils to extravasate from the bloodstream into inflamed tissues. Um, it's a way for the, the cell to minimize the mechanical stress on the nucleus um, as it passes through uh, essentially tight pores. Um, and concurrent with this downregulation of nuclear lamina and increase in flexibility of the nuclear envelope, you have downregulation of the link complex. And essentially what this allows is via heterochromatin attachments uh, through H3K9 trimethylation bound by HP1, um, bound by LBR, this kind of canonical pathway that tethers heterochromatin to the nuclear envelope, um, the, this flexibility essentially allows the chromosomes to shrink wrap themselves in nuclear envelope, and this leads to the lobe structure. Um, if you overexpress lamin A, you can prevent this. Um, and similarly, we showed in mouse neutrophils, if you delete the lamin B receptor, uh, you can also prevent the neutrophils from forming these lobes, um, although it does not affect uh, compaction of heterochromatin in that case. So we isolate these cells from human blood. Um, if you look at them under uh, immunofluorescent microscope, uh, here looking at plasma membrane in red, cytoplasm in green, and the DNA in blue, uh, there's kind of this like stunning morphology of these nuclei when you're used to looking at other cells that are not granulocytes. Um, here you can see uh, five distinct lobes of DNA in the, in the top cell, uh, three in the bottom cell, and this is what the cells generally look like. And so we start approaching these cells um, first essentially from like an academic interest in what, what might be the effect of this lobe structure on chromatin organization. And second, uh, from the immunology's perspective, these are extremely important cells. They make up about 60% of the white blood cells in circulation. Um, and they're usually the first cell to encounter pathogens so, um, of the immune system. So when they extravasate from the blood, they'll be the first cell at a site of infection. And they will, as I'll mention later, they'll start recruiting um, other cells of the innate and adaptive immune system. Uh, so for this talk, I have uh, two main questions. Uh, first is, what is the effect of the acquisition of this lobe nucleus on chromatin architecture? Um, and then second, what changes in chromatin architecture are taking place in response to a pathogen encounter? And you know, what, uh, what is the mechanism of these changes? So for the first question, asking um, essentially, what is the effect of these spatial constraints due to the lobes on the organization of the chromatin um, in, an, in a neutrophil compared to a uh, non polymorph nuclear cell. Um, and we actually started this project looking at a computational model, theoretical model. Um, this was work done with Arthur He and Case Murray's group, a grad student. 
Um, and essentially what Arthur did was he took the genome and made it into five bins computationally, so um, by base pair, so about 600 million base pairs each. And then he placed the chromosomes in the bin, um, in a random bin, and the order of the chromosomes picked to place in are influenced by size. So the larger chromosomes are more probably picked first uh, down to the smallest chromosomes. Uh, with the single rule that the bins can't be overfilled. So you can't add a chromosome if it's going to push the limit above 600 million. Uh, he ran the simulation 10,000 times, and essentially this allowed us to uh, generate a high C contact matrix that predicts chromosome territory pairing given simply spatial constraints of the nucleus. Um, and we call that the descending lobe filling model. So here's a computationally derived high C matrix, uh, chromosomes 1 to 22 on top to bottom and left to right. Um, and the main feature of this, uh, so the main feature of the predicted uh, chromosome interactions based solely on spatial constraints um, is an exaggerated interaction among small chromosomes um, and somewhat agnostic interaction preference among large chromosomes. So we know from published work, uh, imaging well before 3C years and then, of course, um, through the huge amount of high C data that's been generated uh, over the last number of years, uh, that there are actually intrinsic chromosome pairing preferences. Chromosome territories um, are not randomly distributed throughout the cell. Uh, large chromosomes are usually found radially positioned towards the periphery of the cell, and smaller and gene-rich chromosomes usually found towards the middle. So we're calling this the intrinsic pairing preferences. So these are the pairing preferences in a cell with a standard uh, spherical or ovoid nucleus. Um, to model this, we used uh, human embryonic stem cell IC data from Bing Ren's group. Um, and the, the kind of main thing that people have found uh, with HiC looking at preferential chromosome pairing uh, is that the large chromosomes will tend to uh, segregate together, likely because of their shared uh, peripheral position in the nucleus. And the small chromosomes have some small preference for interacting with each other and then tend to interact somewhat promiscuously with the rest of the genome. So we combine these intrinsic chromosome preferences into our descending lobe filling model. And this gave us a predicted neutrophil model. Um, so the main difference between, uh, for our expected neutrophil model and the kind of intrinsic model defined by the empirical data of human embryonic stem cells and other cell types um, is an extremely exaggerated interaction among small chromosomes um, and a somewhat depleted interaction among large chromosomes. Uh, so we did these experiments. Uh, we got blood from human donors, isolated neutrophils, prepared high C libraries. Um, and strikingly, our computational prediction taking into account only spatial allocation due to lobes and intrinsic chromosome pairing preferences, actually was able to predict the empirical data quite nicely. Uh, the neutrophils compared to the human embryonic stem cells have this exaggerated preference for small chromosomes pairing and a somewhat depleted preference for large chromosomes pairing together. Um, this is not simply due to comparing a differentiated cell type to an undifferentiated cell type. Um, other high C data set also published uh, from Bing's group um, in the MR90s uh, shows a similar uh, intrinsic chromosome pairing preferences wherein large chromosomes are preferentially interacting, which is depleted in uh, the neutrophil data. And then looking at the ability of this model to predict each chromosome pair, uh, here I'm showing a cumulative distribution plot um, of the differences of the model and the empirical data. We find that the model actually for almost every chromosome pair does a very good job in predicting which pairs are going to be preferential. There's very little difference between the model um, and the empirical data. Um, and it's a much better predictor than it is for human embryonic stem cells, uh, which the model was partially derived from, suggesting that uh, the changes we see in neutrophil chromosome pairing preferences are truly driven by the spatial constraints of the lobe. Um, and the model, of course, is a poor predictor of IMR90 uh, chromosome pairing, a differentiated cell with an ovoid nucleus. Um, so this allowed us to make a prediction that if we lose the lobes in the nucleus, uh, we should relax these spatial constraints, and the interaction matrix should more closely resemble a uh, standard ovoid cell type. Um, and so one of the other things that actually really drew me to these cells before this project even started uh, was they have, as I mentioned, they have these segmented nucleus into lobes, but if you use a sufficiently strong activator, in this case a non-physiological activator called PMA, which is kind of a, a standard extremely strong activator of immune cells, the neutrophils actually lose their lobes. And this happens extremely quickly within the course of about 30 minutes um, over the course of a couple hours. The, day, the high C data I'm going to show you is a three-hour time point. Um, and so when we uh, isolate neutrophils, treat them with PMA for three hours, uh, the contact matrix between chromosomes looks like this. Um, and what you can notice is that we've returned to somewhat strong preference for the large chromosomes interacting um, and a strong preference for the small chromosomes interacting with the rest of the genome that was lost uh, in the unstimulated cells compared to other ovoid cell types, um, suggesting that loss of the lobes um, relaxes these spatial constraints and allows small chromosomes to interact more fluidly with the rest of the genome and, again, allows large chromosomes to interact 
And not surprisingly, our computational model can no longer accurately predict chromosome pairing in the PMA activated neutrophils. Um, so when you activate these cells, there's actually a huge amount of stress on the nucleus. Um, apart from transcriptional changes due to the immune cell activation, uh, the cells adhere uh, to whatever substrate they're on, and this causes a flattening of the nucleus. And they also chemotax, which causes an elongation of the nucleus. Um, so to make sure we weren't just seeing um, not artifacts, but effects of immune cell activation, uh, we also generate high C data from neutrophils co-cultured with the bacteria E. coli. Um, this also gave us a more physiological relevant uh, stimulant for the neutrophils. So what's interesting with the E. coli co-culture system is that although the neutrophils flatten out and attacks, uh, creating large-scale changes in nuclear morphology, the lobes tend to stay intact. Um, and remarkably, when we looked at the high C data from these neutrophils co-cultured E. coli, a strong preference for the small chromosomes that interact remained. Um, and strikingly, the large chromosomes are not able to kind of return to their highly preferential interactions. Um, and as such, our computational model derived again from the intrinsic pairing preferences, and then adding on top of that spatial constraints is still able to predict uh, E. coli chromosome pairing preferences uh, to the same extent as it can predict uh, unst unstimulated cell pairing preferences. So to summarize this first part, uh, it turns out that as these cells differentiate, the spatial constraints of a large chromosome in a lobe neutrophil nucleus are driving the preferential pairing of these small chromosomes and segregation of the large chromosomes. Um, I want to add, if you look at the slides that I put up online, um, I cut out a slide for the sake of time, but it shows uh, a number of different modeling scenarios uh, for different orders of chromosome um, insertion into the model, uh, showing that the large chromosomes are, in fact, the, the key determinants of this. Um, and we think it works something like this. Um, in the granulocyte progenitors, uh, either granulocyte, monocyte, uh, cells or um, some other intermediate, the nuclear laminas are still strongly expressed. You have a rigid, uh, round nucleus. And due to the intrinsic positioning of, of chromosome territories in the cell, we think the large chromosomes are likely positioned uh, preferentially to the outside. And as the nuclear envelope begins to weaken and the connections with the cytoskeleton are lost, the large chromosomes are essentially uh, working as seeds for these lobes. They're, they're the they're the first large amount of chromatin that's in, ta uh, in contact with the envelope and thus are the first to wrap themselves in the nuclear envelope as differentiation occurs. And this essentially causes them to be spread out in different lobes on average um, and causes the small chromosomes to kind of get squished in together in wherever there's space remaining. Um, so for the second part of the talk, uh, we're very interested in kind of higher resolution analysis of this data and looking at changes in chromatin architecture that are driven by this pathogen counter um, and that may be required for pathogen response. Um, so as I mentioned previously, we have a longstanding interest in these nuclear subcompartments, the A and B compartment, um, specifically in sequestration of the developmentally regulated transcription factors uh, for different lymphocyte lineages to the B compartment, to the nuclear periphery. Um, and we first published this uh, pretty nicely in B cells, uh, both with imaging and high C data in 2012, looking at the key B cell regulating transcription factor, EBF1. And what we found in B cell progenitor, the pre-pro B cell, is that EBF1 is localized to the nuclear periphery um, up against the nuclear lamina, is in the B compartment by high C. And then during differentiation, EBF1 is released from the nuclear lamina and switches from the B to A compartment um, as the pre-pro B cells differentiate into pro B cells. Uh, later on, we showed a very similar uh, phenomenon in T cells, where the T cell transcription factor BC11B in T cell progenitors is uh, positioned to the nuclear periphery and in the B compartment by high C. And then uh, this paper actually drove us uh, into some magnistic work uh, where Takeshi Asoda in our group was able to show that transcription of a non-coding RNA called PIMO-D was required to release BCL11B from the nuclear lamina and switch it from the B to A compartment so that it can be expressed and drive T cell differentiation. Um, so given the importance of this A to B compartment switching uh, in gene regulation, the context of development, um, and given the importance of keeping a number of these neutrophil effector genes silent uh, when the neutrophils are circulating, so they, neutrophils are extremely inflammatory and are associated with a large number of uh, auto-inflammatory diseases. And so essentially you need to keep a lot of neutrophil genes silent until, up until the, the second period. Uh, so we figured this AB compartment switching would be a major factor in governing neutrophil gene expression. Um, so we define the A and B compartments uh, using principal component analysis has been you know, done pretty standard at this point on high C data. Um, and what we found was that our hypothesis was actually completely wrong. Um, so here I'm showing you a scatter plot. Um, at, this is 10 kb resolution principal component analysis of the neutrophil 
uh, high C matrix. So this is the unstimulated data on the x-axis, uh, neutrophils activated with PMA on the y-axis. Um, and so what we're looking for were genes that switched from the B compartment here to the A compartment here um, during activation. Um, and there are actually very few regions uh, that do this. They don't have interesting genes. They're based on our replicate data. Um, these little guys down here are uh, quite noisy. Um, so we worried this might be due to our uh, non-physiological stimulus, PMA. So we redid this analysis with the E. coli data um, and found essentially the same thing. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to just focus on the E. coli data as a relevant human, uh, human pathogen that is a more natural physiological response to neutrophil has. Um, so we hypothesized that the work we'd been doing previously, the timescales were quite different. So in the context of development, these lineage-specific transcription factors um, come on over the course of a number of days or even a week um, during differentiation. So the, the time scale is actually quite long, uh, whereas a pathogen response needs to happen very quickly. Again, in our case, um, within three hours is the time scale we're looking at. Uh, so we hypothesize that the genes that the neutrophil needs for this response might already be in the A compartment. So they might already be euchromatic over here. Um, and we, we thought that maybe what was happening is that um, they were sequestered, the genes needed for pathogen response might be sequestered in one of these A subcompartments that the Aiden lab uh, defines, A1, A2 compartments. Um, so what we looked for were genomic regions that were PC1 positive, so A compartment, but became much more positive. And we're calling this, they had an increase in euchromatic character upon activation. Um, and these, these are essentially the regions here. Um, it's subtle. These are uh, these regions genome-wide. They're about three standard deviations above the mean for changes. Um, and we're able to see them uh, replicated. They're, they're reproducibly um, found across biological replicates. So we're, we're confident these regions, rec uh, these regions are actually picking up meaningful biological changes and meaningful changes in the contact profiles of the chromatin. Um, so keep these regions in mind. These regions have become more euchromatic upon uh, pathogen encounter in the neutrophil. Uh, so when we started doing our kind of data deep dive, um, we looked at the contact matrices just from like a a top-down approach. So here's a 100 kilobase resolution high C matrix of chromosome 20. Um, unstimulated cells are on the left. E. coli co-culture neutrophils on the right uh, with PC1 values, again, positive being A compartment, negative being B compartment. Um, and at first glance, I think it's pretty clear to people who look at this data, there's not really any large-scale changes to the chromosome organization despite these large-scale morphological changes to the nucleus, um, suggesting that the kind of uh, intranuclear, uh, or sorry, intrachromosomal interactions are quite stable um, during the physiological response, even given the mechanical stress on the nucleus, which makes sense as the neutrophils are transcriptionally responsive cells. Um, so when we looked at the log two comparison of these cells, uh, what we found was actually quite striking. Um, if you look carefully at this, uh, what you find looking for blue pixels, which are regions that become, uh, have increased interactions upon E. coli encounter, we see these very discrete and very specific stripes of blue throughout these uh, chromosome contact matrices. And these correspond to these very distinct regions that undergo intense local remodeling of chromatin. And this local remodeling corresponds um, to large scale changes in interactions throughout the entire chromosome in many cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. So going back to the PC1 scatter plot I showed, if we overlay these regions that become more PC1 positive, so more euchromatic, <clears throat> upon E. coli encounter, they overlap quite nicely. So for instance, this cluster here uh, corresponds to these stripes here. Um, so these changes we're identifying visually through the contact matrices. Uh, we also identified computationally through changes in PC1 values. Um, so what do these changes in PC1 values mean? Um, one of the kind of uh, archetypal regions of the genome that makes this change is the chemokine locus. Um, and from the immune perspective, this locus is uh, its transcription control is extremely important. Um, it codes for a number of important chemokines, which are uh, secreted molecules that attract other immune cells, also very pro-inflammatory. Uh, specifically, CXCL8 codes for IL-8, which is a, uh, the primary neutrophil chemoattractant. So neutrophils will encounter a pathogen, express IL-8, secrete it, and attract other neutrophils to site infection. And similarly, uh, CXCL2 um, is a key macrophage chemoattractant. Um, so what happens when you look at the PC1 values that we identified as changing, they're actually still, although they're reproducible um, across biological replicates and uh, quite large compared to your average change, they're actually quite subtle. So what we found with these regions is that there are usually these little valleys of PC1 score here found in the middle um, in these larger regions of high PC1 values. So um, it looks like this is like a subcompartment um, 
of the euchromatin. And when you activate these cells, this little valley flattens out into a uniformly high plateau. And looking at the contact matrices, what we found is that uh, these little valleys uh, are organized as these small self-associating domains. So I have my pointer in the middle of them here. Um, and although this entire region is euchromatic, the interactions of this little PC1 modest domain uh, seem to be focused in on itself and separate from the surrounding uh, more euchromatic region. And when you activate the cell, these uh, self-associating interactions are lost and the interactions become uniform across the, the higher euchromatic domain here. And this can be seen in the log two differential uh, where the interactions within the subdomain are more intense in the unactivated cells um, and then interactions spread out through the entire PC1 region, uh, PC1 positive region as the cells encounter the E. coli and this region becomes activated. Um, so what's happening spatially? Um, as I mentioned, we're very interested in sequestration of genes to nuclear lamina. Uh, so we performed DNA fish fluorescent in situ hybridization, uh, looking at the uh, physical positioning of the CXCL8 gene uh, within the nucleus. Um, and what we found is in unstimulated cells, uh, the positioning is actually um, somewhere between lamin associated and unassociated. So for every cell, we had a probe at the CXCL locus, CXCL8, um, as well as a heterochromatic control probe. So if you look at the heterochromatic control probe here, and the uh, positioning in unstimulated cells is blue, E. coli co-cultured cells is green. Um, the heterochromatin, heterochromatic control is generally within about 500 nanometers of the nuclear envelope. Um, and a similar thing can be said for some portion of the CXCL8 loci. Um, however, they spread somewhat between a peripheral localization and a localization to nuclear interior. However, when you activate the cells, this locus, um, apart from losing the subdomain structure and merging with the greater euchromatin, is also moving towards the nuclear interior, away from the nuclear periphery. Uh, and this is not simply due to activating the cells, as the heterochromatic control remains firmly in touch with the uh, nuclear lamina in most cases. Um, and I should mention, I think, uh, as people listening probably figured out, this is uh, very much in line with uh, the A1, A2 subcompartments that have been previously published, um, as well as predictions made in uh, the Belmont Group's uh, TSA-Seq um, paper, uh, where they showed that um, a number of regions, specifically these A2 subcompartments of euchromatin, kind of live in this no man's land between nucleolamina and splicing speckles. So we don't have the experiments done now, but we think that's likely what we're seeing. Um, okay, so we have this merging of a euchromatic subcompartment with the greater euchromatic regions as the cells become activated. So what's happening molecularly? Um, here are a number of linear genomic features. Uh, so unstimulated, again, will be on the left. Uh, on the right are the E. coli co-cultured uh, linear genomic features. On the top is RNA-seq, so we have a strong induction of CXCL8 and CXCL2. Um, along with this uh, induction, similar to what we saw in the context of T-cell development, uh, this transcription corresponds to a large recruitment of the cohesin complex. Um, CTCF and uh, CTCF ChIP-seq and H3K27, acetyl ChIP-seq uh, looking at enhancers, remain largely unchanged. Um, so looking at this subdomain, we also went through the genome and looked at insulation scores, so the ability of any given genomic region to block chromatin contacts. Um, and what we find when we look at the difference in insulation scores, uh, the positive difference here indicates a loss of insulating ability. So this subdomain boundaries can no longer insulate interactions when they encounter as E. coli, and that's part of the merging with this greater euchromatic compartment. Um, and similarly, as, this, as we show, the PC1 values change. Um, initially, zooming in on CXCL8, which is close to the boundary of the subdomain, uh, similar to what we saw in T cells, we see a large amount of non-coding transcription, peaks of which correspond to de novo cohesin recruitment. Um, so we think the act of transcription itself uh, may be involved in the motion of this euchromatic subcompartment. Um, so looking across other genes, so that was just a single locus, um, when we looked at a number of other genes important for the immune response, uh, we found very similar behavior in that in the unstimulated cells, uh, the immune response gene, in this case SGK1, which is required to inhibit neutrophil apoptosis uh, during activation, exists in a small euchromatic subdomain and upon activation merges with the surrounding euchromatin. Um, a number of other important immune response genes perform the same way. Um, and then there are a couple cases where we actually, instead of seeing this kind of one blue stripe, we saw two blue stripes in the locus. Um, and this actually uh, corresponded to the formation of de novo CTCF anchored chromatin loops. Um, and given, uh, given the extremely high stringency of the juicer pipeline, we actually were only able to identify 44 high confidence loops that were specific to E. coli activation. Um, and of those 44, 10 actually fall in the 1% the of the genome that behaves like this. And we think um, that this uh, subcompartments gaining these chromatin loops may be part of what allows them to join the greater euchromatic compartment. 
Um, and then not surprisingly, when we looked at uh, what genes these were that behave these way uh, topologically, uh, these are almost all immune response genes. So looking at the gene ontology enrichment of genes within these regions, uh, the most enriched, uh, most enriched functional groups are, include cytokine signaling, regulation, defense response, and then other gene groups associated with uh, different cytokine, chemokine uh, responses, as well as pathogen responses. So the vast majority of genes in regions that exist as these small uh, euchromatic subdomains that then merge with the larger euchromatic domain are defense response genes in neutrophil and are specifically moving in response to a pathogen encounter. Uh, so to summarize the second and final part, um, we think what we've found here are distinct euchromatic subcompartments that code for these pathogen defense genes. Um, and when the neutrophil needs them, these gene, genes gain cohesion, transcription, euchromatic character, moving away from the nuclear periphery um, and towards the nuclear interior uh, during a pathogen and in response to a pathogen encounter, um, as shown by our model here. And this um, remarkably occurs extremely quickly uh, within about three hours of the time point we're looking at. Um, so that's what we have right now. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Casey, has been a really phenomenal support of this project and some really great insight. Uh, my collaborator, Ina Zhu, processed uh, the IC libraries and, as I mentioned, uh, pioneered this in the mouse system. Uh, Arthur, he did a chromosome pairing modeling. I showed first uh, Hanbin Liu, for reasons that are unclear to me, has a server with GPUs at his house and so ran our uh, CTCF loop calling. Um, Takeshi Isoda and the Nizay lab uh, helped with blood draws. Um, as I mentioned, for every single experiment I do, I have to get people to donate blood. <laughs> so many thanks to them and the people who help with that. Uh, these cells only live about six hours, so we have a lot of blood flowing around. Um, and then many thanks to Murray Lab uh, members and, and uh, members of Bing's lab, as well as our other collaborators, uh, funding from the 4 dn and, and from the Frontiers of Innovation Scholars Program here at UCSD. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has.